Um, good, hello and uh, welcome to the first uh, event of our Art for the Environment conversation series for 2024. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you, um, some of you in person, some of you online. My name is Camilla Palestra. Um, I'm a curator, a researcher and educator. Um, I also curatorial associate at the Center for Sustainable Fashion at the University of the Arts. Um, as part of my role, I've been running the Art for the Environment residency program since 2015, when it was launched by Professor Lucy Orta to provide UAL graduates with um, fully funded opportunities to join residency programs across, across the world to professionalize their research and practice. So building on shared experiences, um, common lines of inquiry and uh, resonances in practice and research, new and past residents um, come together for this series of conversation to reflect on the impact and legacy of the practice um, and research and reflect on the creative role to envision a world of tomorrow. This series of conversation also coincides with the exhibition Art for the Environment, which is currently um, on show at the Groundwork Gallery in Kingsley, Norfolk. It's open until the 8th of June, so I would encourage everyone to go and visit um, one foot trip to Norfolk. Um, so I have the pleasure today to moderate the conversation with Beth Robertson, Matt Hall, Nicholas Holt and Daniel Kinsborg. I'll briefly introduce, so there will be two speakers um, presenting their own research very briefly and then engaging in conversation and then the second um, pair of speakers and then we will have at the end some time for the Q&A. Uh, before introducing the speakers, I also wanted to thank uh, the Centre for Sustainable Fashion for their support postgraduate community at UAL. We have here Fred and Kat um, that uh, made this series uh, possible. And uh, also all our uh, Art for the Environment friends and community across the world. So to start with Beth, um, Beth Robertson was resident at NAR, Nature, Art and Habitat in Italy in 2023. She's a sound artist based in London and Glasgow and the recent graduate of the Sound Arts MA um, here at LCC. Her interdisciplinary practice seeks to clear the relationship we have with our environment through sound. With a background in geography, Beth creates work that celebrates the hybridity of humans and uses activist listening in response to the climate crisis. Through the use of field recordings, photography and composition, she creates sound maps and installation that investigate entangled local ecologies and experiment with shifting place identities. She's, she further explores the themes in a monthly radio show on Resonance FM. <coughs> and Mac, uh, Mac Hall was a resident at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park in 2015 our very first resident um, of AER. She's an expanded sound artist who works in the UK and internationally. She received a highly commended Orem in 2021, whilst Waves of Resistance for Galway 2020 was nominated for an Ivor Novello um, in sound art. Her work is concerned with art for the environment, expanded radio, expanded sculpture and wireless technology. She is currently developing a series of works around air pollution. Mac was a founder of London Art Station Resonance FM and Community Arts Radio in the UK. She completed a practice-based PhD at UAL and she's currently a practice-based researcher and senior lecturer at Contemporary Christ Church, Church University and sustainability lead for the School of Creative Arts and Industries. So I leave it to you for your presentation. Uh, let's try to keep it uh, to the time allocated so we have a bit of time for conversation. Um, 
So over to you, Beth. And so yeah, people can see you speaking more around the site. Um, so hiya, my name's Beth Robertson, uh, so I'm a sound artist and um, yeah, so I did the MA Sound Arts at LCC in 2022 and um, was part of the AER um, residency programme at NAR um, last year. Um, so yeah, just again, kind of my, my work is like um, I use yeah, field recording, photography, um, sound installation, music, radio to kind of um, explore uh, local colleges and also kind of look towards listening as I'm working at POTUS in collective form of environmental activism. Um, yeah. Uh, so um, I went to Valtelleggio in Italy for the NAR residency. And um, these are a couple of pictures that I took when I was there. As you can see, it was really, really beautiful and um, loads of trees. And the theme for the residency when I was there was air. So I wanted to kind of look at air as this like passing of breath between um, the vegetable world, the trees, and also kind of like fleshy bodies. Um, literally, like as the as we like, you know, breathe in oxygen, release CO2, and the trees absorb the CO2, and release oxygen. Um, but also like um, using more like breath as a kind of like um, symbolism for all of these um, really complex hybrid um, symbiotic relationships we have with trees um, uh, that have you know evolved and spanned for like you know, tens of thousands of years. Um, yeah. So I created three sound pieces, um, each kind of exploring a different like um, bodily process that we might share or have like a symbiotic relationship with. The vegetal world. Um, I think sound is a really good medium for kind of like breaking down um, pre-existing binaries and kind of like um, blurring these boundaries that we have between bodies. Um, so each of the sound pieces, like I looked at lung, skin and roots um, and I wanted to kind of hypersensitize us to like um, how trees might experience pleasure or pain at a very like um, human way but also maybe kind of help us understand how vegetal we are as well um for example like skin i have like sounds of like scratching skin with the sounds of like um insects that might um you know irritate or annoy the bark on trees like beetles that might burrow um in and then also like compare that to kind of um, maybe pollinators which would be a really welcome touch on um trees um because i think that that's drawing <coughs> loads of parallels between like skin and bark and then for roots, it was the roots in our brain, how we explore and um, thought and ideas and are curious and comparing that to roots underneath the soil of trees as they kind of explore and hold memory and um, interact with their environment. Yeah. Um, so at the end of the residency, I did like a installation where I create three different listening spaces um, for each of the sounds that I'd created. Um, and I kind of identified each listening space by hanging up like Polaroids and QR codes. The Polaroids were like of the, um, the different spaces that I was recording and researching in. Then the QR codes took you to a web page that I created with all the sounds. Um, so it was quite nice to see how like people were interacting with this. Like um, as they were kind of like dangling in the air, like people would be reaching up trying to catch the QR codes to scan them. Um, also there was issues because it's very remote, so the QR codes didn't work brilliantly. <laughs> and with the signal that was there. So I did also just put up my laptop and just allow people to kind of read about what it was they were listening to, um, which was all on the web page. And that was quite nice, it kind of created like gatherings where people were like listening together. But also when people could get on their phones, they could move between the different listening spaces as well, which was really nice. Um, so I took all that kind of feedback and um, everything to kind of um, uh, develop the project a bit more for a groundwork gallery. Um, so I created two sound installations and a booklet. Um, the first sound installation was Becoming Tree. So I remixed two of the sound pieces, Skin and Roots, 
um, for the space in Groundwork Gallery. Um, it's kind of this liminal space between the two galleries, so it's nice to kind of have that side piece that um, uh, kind of transitions you between the two spaces. And then I hung up the Polaroids as well, just to kind of recontextualise the sounds and since it's like a site specific project. Um, and then the second installation I did was Parlour Tourism. Um, so this one um, was looking more at the, the lungs sound piece that I'd created, which was um, like kind of weaving together breath and also looking at um, how um, different trees are activated by the wind in different ways. Uh, so tourism means the whispering of wind be between the leaves. And with my research, I learned that actually every different species of tree and the season that the trees are in um, create really different sounds um, as they're activated by the wind. Um, so you have like conif coniferous, which is like the, the needles. Uh, the wind can oscillate around the needles create quite a high pitch sound or like with deciduous trees and the leaves are flatter and they flutter a bit more. And um, you have like the texture and the size, these all create different sounds. You have lots of poets and writers that um, kind of use really descriptive words for a very specific tree at a time of year or even just a species of tree. Like you have um, applause, marching, ocean sounds. So um, I created this, uh, so I kind of developed that root sound piece with more like about the kind of wind and breath and these different sounds that uh, trees make to kind of like um, allow us to um, identify the voices of different trees. And I used hair, dry, uh, hair dryers because the kind of medium of listening in my work is really important because I want the sounds to be kind of contextualised. And um, I think so like previously I've used stethoscopes to listen to sounds, kind of create like an instrument of care and an act of care. I've used uh, telephone receivers to kind of anticipate like a voice at the other end of the line with more than human voices. Um, so for this, I was um, taking the kind of intimate, playful spaces of the hair dryers, but also all their connotations with like hair salons um, back in the day that would have actually played a really important role in building communities, especially with that kind of feminist aspect of um, taking, you know, women's voices that were often kind of dismissed, maybe as gossip, but actually that the, the, these were really important spaces in the building of communities. And I think that the sounds of like trees can often be dismissed. So I think that kind of um, bringing that kind of feminist aspect into this equal conversation is like a good idea to like um, allow us to start a conversation with um, our interspecies communities and help cultivate them. Uh, so this was the newspaper I created for the installation as well. So you can see like I uh, talked through all the different sounds that trees make and also kind of a little step by step on how to begin to identify the specific voices of trees in order to kind of begin that conversation. Um, yeah and then finally I made a booklet as well. Um, so this is what I made just after the residency. So it's like a collection of all the research, photographs, sound pieces that I've made and um, it's just to gather together and also make like um, there was some listening um, meditations in there and also like um, instructions on how to create a seed bomb and um, it was all basically just to kind of re-emphasize that you know listening is a form of activism and listening to sounds like of the trees as voices is, um, uh, is an act of care and care like by cleaning the air we're cleaning our own breath and like um, to care for the environment, to care for yourselves and vice versa. So making the seed ball is like an activist form of doing it. Um, yeah, I think that's me. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks Beth, that was really interesting actually. And there is a lot of crossover with our work, so it's going to be interesting to discuss. I'm um, just going to show you uh, some of the work that I have done that led me up to my work with the environment. So we're going to brush through quite a few um, pictures here. So if you could keep going until we get to Jen Warner's slide. So really, I'm just going to give you a bit of background on my what I call expanded radio work, work that I've been making for the last sort of, uh, I've, been, I've been playing sound art since 2000, so 24 years, which is, quite amazing when I think about it and quite scary at the same time. So when I started using radios, I used them as kind of ready-made um, and I was interested in 
when I was doing my PhD, I was looking at 100 years of radio art and thinking about how I could look at different techniques used by other radio artists. Oh, if we stop here, that'd be great. And think and uh, think about how I could play with radio in a way that was not just making programs for the radio, which was about radio and and using the technology. And so after doing many installations where I was using actual radios as speakers and transmitters, um, and actually experimenting with surround sound by using different transmitters to, to get different sounds at different radios, I started building. Um, could you go back one slide, actually? And another one. <laughs> so, yeah, I started um, building transmitters and putting them on different objects. And actually, if we go, if you go back a few slides, you'll see. There you go. That's it. Dream lessons here. Um, if you go one slide more, <laughs> um, book radio is where I basically built a transmitter, put it on a book, and it allowed me to broadcast the contents of the book to to um, to, to the audience. And so I was quite interested in playing with this idea of building transmitters on different things. And the, one of the things I've wanted to do for a really long time was to do um, a, a tree that broadcasts its content, so a sort of pirate radio tree in essence. And so Art of the Environment came up, it was perfect. It was just the perfect thing because I've been waiting for a place to get commissioned to do that. So prior to that, I made book radio, and if you carry on two slides, um, I've done Dream Vessels, which is basically transmitting vessels where people, um, I have workshops for people to build and taught them how to build the transmitters and then they've recorded their dreams and then broadcast their dreams. So if we move forward now, then um, in terms of um, what I did at the YSP, I was looking back at radio history because I looked at 100 years of radio history and I was really interested in General Owen Squire, who, who is this man here. He's actually the inventor of music, which is sort of elevator music, etc. But he also used trees as antennas. So in, you know, in the 1920s in America, in well, 1919 in this one, in this case, he's using them as antennas to pick up sort of army signals. And I was thinking, what if he did it the other way? We used the trees as, as transmitters. So in the next uh, slide, at YSP, I basically um, built a, a transmitter circuit onto an oak tree there and put in, if you go to the next slide, put in uh, sensors in the tree so you could get its reaction to light and also a probe so you could get its reaction to water and then and then broadcast that in real time on FM from the sculpture park. So I was very excited to do this project and a huge thanks to um, UAL for uh, enabling me to do that. I think I had a budget of about six, it wasn't very much, about £100 or something. So it was, and a lot of my work is working with technology in a really DIY way with very limited budgets. And so um, this was um, up at the YSP for a year, which was fantastic um, for me to have this opportunity to have my work next to sort of Henry Moore, who's my living sculpt, you know, transmitting pirate radio station um, of a tree broadcasting itself. If we go to the next slide, um, and so, um, if you carry, carry on, sorry, if you a couple more slides. Then I got involved with the Gerald Open Forest and I came up with this idea of doing um, transmit, again, coming back from the work I'd done with um, at YSP, it allowed me to sort of think about dream spaces and trees, again, using trees and forests, and particularly the beautiful trees at Vegbury, which are very similar to the trees that General Warren Squire used as a place of listening to people's dreams. So if you go to the next slide, um, this is the dream space, which is kind of a birder's hut, which um, would, would fill, be filled with radios that you could listen to the dreams once they've been done. So if we go to the next slide, uh, you'll see that I actually realised that with 50 radios and the nine, um, at Bow, at the Bow Arts, um, again supported by Camilla, so thank you for that Camilla. Um, if we carry on, <laughs> um, I've done, as I carried on doing my projects, again sometimes using multiple radios, sometimes not. Um, another project that came out of my time doing this what, up the environment was transmission spores, so uh, we keep moving forward. These are some of the other projects I did, and I won't have time in eight minutes to tell you about all those, but this one here, transmission spores, was for the ASH archive, and I was asked to make a piece in response to ASH dieback, and so I wanted to do a smaller version of the YSP work that was more portable, I could take to places rather than just, you know, you can't really take it all to Sculpture Park. So um, this was basically a piece of ash uh, uh, which had ash dieback on it, those are the spores of the ash dieback. 
and I listened to, to um, different poems around um, the, the scientific usage of, um, of ash dieback. So I cut up the, the poems about ash dieback into sort of spore like forms and then transmitted them from this piece of ash in the gallery. So that was my response to it. It was a kind of like a number station. So it was broadcasting, I don't know, about, you know, almost like a jingle every every few seconds. And it would only last about 10 seconds, but it was uh, quite radiophonic in its sound. I'm sorry, I'm not playing it sound, but um, that's transmission spores that came out of this. If we carry on now to landfill, <laughs> So I've been thinking about air a lot, and Skyport Radio was one of those things, but we'll keep going. And um, if we stop here on landfill pollution, this is where I'm focusing at the moment, because during lockdown, I discovered that I was living right next to a landfill and didn't even know about it. But I started to know about it because it started to smell quite badly. And I actually, when I first went there um, during the lockdown, all the fences were down. You could just walk straight into the site and just go right up to the gas leaking out of it, which was actually quite disturbing. I obviously did tell my councillors straight away and say, can they can do something? Um, and so what I found, I started looking into landfill and found out, you know, obviously it's, a, it's an international and local problem. And particularly in the UK, I was looking at a particular company, which is Valencia, who, um, who used to be known as, um, I forgot now the name, but they just changed their name last year to Valencia. But they own seven sites around the country. They used to own about 30. But now they're cu currently running Shelford Landfill, which is my landfill. And I've hooked up with other landfills around the country, um, one in Derby, one in Manchester. Um, and I was very aware of one up in, in Sunderland, uh, called, um, which has a campaign called Stop the Stink, because basically this, these companies uh, were making life unbearable for the people living in, near them. And I found this out for a short period, for about eight months, we had really bad stink across Canterbury while they were capping the landfill. However, that problem stopped for a while. And then in recent, in, in, then this year, we found out that, um, the land, that, that, that I found out that basically across the country, there are 17 landfill, I think 17 sites, which have got dangerous lactate going into the um water grid and the government isn't saying which who they are anyway i've been trying to have them many minutes anyway maybe we can talk about this a bit more Beth, in a moment so i've been looking into sort of all the regulation issues with landfill with the ea and how it's being under regulated and the problems it's causing i've recorded the methane gases that's coming out of the landfill and if we move forward again i made a project with peter coates Point, sorry, called Don't Listen Up, which we did at for Whitstall Biennale, and we recorded the sound of the, um, not only I recorded the landfill, and Pete recorded the sound of the polluted sea, because we're near, near Whitstall, where it's just got a huge amount of sewage in the sea, so using hydrophone recordings, field recordings, really it was kind of unveiling what I'm calling the Garden of England's Dirty Secrets, so there's a lot of uh, rubbish and pollution happening on the sea and land and air in the area where we live. So we didn't have, to, like many of my sound artist friends who often go around the world to find these issues. I've got them all on my doorstep, <laughs> which has been quite useful for these projects. If we go to the next page, um, I'm currently working on what I'm calling a radio air garden. And this is, I'm actually growing plants that absorb pollution and using antenna-like structures to help them grow using um, electroculture from the 1920s. And this is a picture of an electroculture mask from the 1920s and the coils that have been used to help plants grow. If you go to the next page, um, and then I'm making projects that at the moment, which we're going to go into the radio air, air garden as broadcasts. Uh, last summer, I made a piece called Long Way, which was a collaborative piece with all these wonderful people who came to the Pyrenees to do a radio mm -hmm. work uh, sort of camp. And I was very interested in the tiny plastic particles that are, ha are flowing across the Pyrenees. And so um, met, we made a sort of site specific piece in response to the plastic particle pollution that was done as a sort of mini transmitted um, FM installation around the town where the camp happens. And so that's some pictures from that. And finally, um, and then just recently, I did a piece just in the last few weeks called Breathe Easy again recording the sound of breath 
of dancers doing fire breathing and the sound of the sea and this idea of you know of, of trying to capture the invisible um, with through sound um, air, um, capturing air through sound has been kind of one of the things I've been trying to do in recent, in recent times now really that's probably I've had enough time so I'm going to have to stop speaking I'm used to speaking for about an hour so that's why I'm rambling a little bit but um, obviously brief I'm happy to answer any questions you've got after we've had our discussion or during it. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> come back um yeah i'm so sorry the time is so limited i know it's very difficult to go through 20 24 years of uh, uh sound radio art in, in a few minutes and, and same for you beth uh but at least now we have a bit of our uh, time for your conversation because uh, there are a lot of uh, resonances between your work um it is a shame in a way that we didn't listen to any sound, <laughs> talking about sound art. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and, and maybe uh, towards the end we can play something. It will be also available. Um, I didn't mention the, the the talk is actually is being recorded and will be made available on the YouTube uh, channel of the postgraduate community at UL and there will be links to the sound so hopefully we can also I mean we can catch up with the sound. But anyway I wanted to um, it was really interesting to see all this uh, journey um, from the beginning of also from my perspective the beginning of um, the AER program until the very recent uh, residency last year uh, and see how many you know kind of a connection relations are uh, built through the program uh, kind of common lines as I said common lines of inquiries uh, looking at trees looking at vintage technology as well in, in your cases but I leave it to you I know you you have some questions for each other um, so please hey John stop it um, yeah, I guess um, one of the main things really what what drew you to radio life and music. Well, I think I think it's because I was interested in the fact that you could do so much with it, and unlike TV or other forms, because it's this is pre-internet, you could you, you had the ability to experiment with it in a way that people hadn't done before. So obviously, people were making experimental video, etc. But when I got involved in radio art, it was in 1998, and it was at the very beginning of, of when, when residence started, and, the, and no one had done that before. In England, we had a very closed monopoly on how you could use broadcast spaces. So it's kind of like this idea that you could tinker with it. And since I was a kid, I'd always like tinkering with things, pulling things apart. I was never allowed to do these kind of things. So it was kind of like wanting to, but then actually actually wanting to have a go myself rather than just watch other people do things you know it was quite a male thing as well being into technology and radio and sound at the time and so i found it was my kind of also bit my as, as someone who also come up through music as well it was kind of like for me a natural place to be yeah mm -hmm. and what about yourself how did you get into sound art um, um, well, I guess uh, I did my I did geography and you learn how to do um, field recording and geography and I really enjoyed doing that. Um, and then I was also a musician as well, so it felt like quite a nice way to kind of um, explore different sites. I think it was more like oh, I'd find something interesting about the site that I like, and the things that I'd want to do would be to do field recording, photograph, and learn like, different the ecosystems within that. Place. I think radio in particular is quite nice to think that it's something that's um, you know everywhere it's that you know AM and FM which is in the air anyway and like um, you know to be able to just kind of like uh, the, the way of thinking about thought and ideas is, as being these like transmissions that you can kind of tune into or tune out of is actually I think really nice way of thinking. I like this but I mean with your and transmission spores I thought it was really lovely as trees are like um, do you think that could have been maybe like an inspiration for because all of the history that you talked about with during the war and the trees being playing like a crucial role in transmission? Um, do you think trees inspired radio? 
Oh, well, I, don't, I think they, they've got, well, I think as you mentioned earlier, they've got their own ecosystems where they can kind of communicate with each other with their roots. Mm -hmm. And they, they're kind of, you know, you can, you, you can think of it as a nice kind of way, way of thinking about, um, I think they're quite, there are lots of analogies you can make with them. I don't think that they're, they're, they're using their own electricity and impulses, etc. I know lots of musicians and sound artists like to tap into to the sounds of the actual plants that they're growing um, using their el electromagnetic frequencies that they're emitting. I'm not a scientist, so I'm, I'm probably going to be embarrassing myself in terms of trying to talk about it technically in those ways, but I think um, I, for me, there's a poeticness around it. So when I was thinking about Ash Steinbeck, I was also thinking about radio's resilience. Mm -hmm. The fact that when I was looking at the future of FM radio and mm -hmm. where it might be going, and the fact that we're all using it wireless technology on our phones, it's you know wireless technology is still key to what we do today. So it hasn't disappeared. It's just coming back in different forms. That was one of the things I was thinking. So when I was thinking about the tree um, for, for ash dye back, I was thinking about, well, in, in the UK, we found that out that some of our ash trees are actually really resilient and they found what, and, and, and so, so, so they are making it through. And I kind of felt like that because where I actually live, I have insane amounts of ash trees trying to grow all the time because I live near a huge tree that's spawning tiny little ash trees every five minutes. So I felt that that found it to be quite a resilient kind of uh, tree. And, and for me, I know the metaphor was that, that radio is like ash trees, it's, it's very resilient. And although the iPad's, iPod has died now and the video cassettes, radio still lives on. <laughs> so I'm just making those kind of a little bit cheesy analogies around um, um, around around trees. And, and also sort of the, the mythical side of ash as well, ash trees, um, and, and how that works as well. So thinking about that a little bit too. So you, I really like the way you, you documented your work and the way you put together the um, uh, sort of the, the, the newspaper that you made. I thought that was fantastic. And your um, um, books. Can you tell me a bit how you got into sort of pr um, producing them? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's, you know, to do something with sound, which is such a leaky, needy material thing, um, which is such a lovely material to work with. It's also quite difficult to like hold in your hand and like give to someone and be like, I love this thing. And I think um, even though that's quite nice, it's also like it does lead you to creating things online a lot of the time. And there's something really nice about physically making something and then having all of these ideas as like this little gathering and something that you can kind of like um, you know, to, I think big binding is something I've just started getting into. It's insane how difficult <laughs> it is to like um, go through the whole process of making something from start to finish. But I think it's a nice way to round up all of your ideas and all of your thoughts, um, and um, but also like some to create something kind of physical. And there's a strange tension as well between me talking about trees and then the paper being used in the book um, and how. Um, culturally we're so entangled as with trees as a material as well and that kind of we are going to use it as a material it does deserve you know respect and that kind of it needs to be part of that conversation as well as a, as a tension um and I'm, I'm, it's interesting you both were here at L lcc surrounded by people just making traditional mm -hmm. printing and books yeah. and i think that obviously must have rubbed off us mm -hmm. on us in some ways as well because i as i myself like to bring the visual aspect to my work, although it sound, I, I again see that there's a huge benefit of having a visual identity to go with the work. So that's interesting. Yeah. It was also wonder, wonderful to work with you from a curatorial perspective, thinking about an exhibition and how to present the work. So there are some more ephemeral aspects of the work like the, the sound plate on the stairwell of um, the groundwork alley but then also some material something that you can touch or you can inhabit like in the, the little shed uh, in your case i'm conscious of time and i wanted to introduce our next speakers um 
So you can leave the stage, Thank you. and then we'll be back all together for a final um, Q and A. So I welcome Nicholas and Daniel on the stage. Um, so Nicholas Holt, um, who is resident at Hoya at the um, Ecologia in Spain in 2023. He's a UK-based photographer and writer with a focus on the journey, nature, and history. He holds an MA in photojournalism and documentary photography with distinction from the University of the Arts, LCC, um, 2022. His photography has been recognized by the Sony World Photography Awards, the Royal Photographic Society, and our Open Walls. Nicholas has worked with Geographical Magazine, Suitcase Magazine, JRNY Magazine, and Brat Travel Club Magazine. He is a founding member of the Collective 454, an international group of research-led, environmental-focused photographers. And Daniel Ginsburg is, was resident also at Hoya in Spain in 2022. He is an Oxford-based photographer who works with cameraless and lens-based photography, both in digital and analog mediums. Inspired by fiction, psychology, and the agency of nature, he uncovers human and non-human narratives in our age of mass extinction. Using experimental techniques, he playfully explores the unseen perspectives and the unknowable ways of being of plants, fungi, and other overlooked critters by utilizing the structures and processes of nature, teetering on a line between science seance and alchemy in which the capturing of light becomes one tool of many and the work can become itself wide. His previous works have looked at our everyday urban relationship to nature, at grieving the ghosts of extinction and at using photography to imagine new possibilities of interspecies communication. He is continuing to look to the future and imagine entangled worlds. So I leave it to Nicholas to start with his presentation, followed by Daniel, and then again, a few minutes of conversation before the learning. Thank you. Is that a full screen? I think it's maybe missing. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so I was um, sort of interested, really, if you look at the landscape of Hoya, you can see that um, this is all desertified, arid land. And actually, the only thing that actually grows on there is almond trees. Um, I mean, they grow crops which almost always fail and they might um, sort of feed them the cattle, but essentially this is all semi-dead arable land. So this, so I wanted basically to um, sort of investigate and um, um, interact with this um, sort of environment. Of, of, of this really, uh, and, and next slide, I think. Yeah. Um, so in um, Europe and all all over the world, one of the, the sort of main problems is this um, um, degre degradation of of um, soil, so basically uh, um, soil through uh, uh, poor agricultural practices is uh, becoming um, unfertile. Um, so this has been cited by the UN as, as sort of one of the major um, sort of environmental challenges of our, our time. Um, so I wanted to um, sort of investigate and um, interact with this land. Uh, next slide. Um, so even though I had this sort of overriding interest, I wanted to actually free myself up so that I, I could um, sort of use these um, two weeks as an experiment, basically, to um, experiment with all uh, um, kinds of uh, photography and, and also writing. Um, next slide. Um, so I um, started making photographs, which is basically you get a sort of a piece of um, 
look at the paper and you um, sort of bury it in soil or um, plant material, um, sort of activate it with water and you can leave it for minutes, hours, overnight or days. So I spent uh, sort of just, sort of quite a long time um, experimenting with this uh, and it was a way of um, sort of interacting with the land. Um, something I've never sort of never done before and, and I had had no idea what the uh, uh, results would be. Um, uh, next slide. So I did, um, I sort of had this uh, method of working where it's almost like a walking meditation with the camera. I uh, uh, do a bit of Zen. So I try and integrate my Zen practice with my uh, uh, photographic practice. Um, so these are film uh, photographs, medium format film. Um, you can see over here, this is an old, old sort of abandoned farm. And actually farmers left the land years ago and 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 um, Hoya is the setting of it is actually in this abandoned um, farmhouse and they so sort of made it work for them um, and, and next slide uh, so this is four by five film I hadn't ever shot four by five film before so I was sort of interested in um, experimenting with that. Uh, next slide. Um, digital photographs, um, which is actually what I usually sh shoot. So you can see the land here. This is almost like a lunar landscape. There's actually nothing growing at all. Um, Tree roots here, you can see, are just just um, barely hanging on. Um, next slide. Uh, 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 next slide. Uh, so these are just sort of general um, photographs. You can see the massive erosion is um, present in this uh, um, landscape. Uh, and uh, next slide. Next. So after sort of experimenting with these um, various methods, I sort of decided that I wanted something sort of beyond straight photography. So I started looking at, at, at pulling my influences from land art. Um, next slide. Um, some of the photographs actually I thought worked okay. After a few weeks I sort of looked at them and, and thought the interactions were interesting. So I um, hit upon this sort of triptych style where we have a site Photograph of the site, um, my photogram um, sort of interaction with the site, and then actually a set of instructions, which is more more or less what I did on the actual site. Um, um, grid reference here, and exposure time here, um, date here, and uh, sort of a record of the material and my interaction with it there. Uh, next slide. So I did three of these. Next slide. Next slide. Um, in the end, I actually enlarged one of these up. So sort I of liked the idea of it as a colour field painting. Kind of a colour field painting. Um, next slide. And um, in the end, actually, I ended up doing an earth rubbing and actually handwriting everything, not not having it printed. I thought it seemed a, a little bit more natural and um, honest, really. So that's the final artwork. Uh, next slide. 
These are installation shots. Um, next. Um, so I'm going to Senegal next month to um, um, carry, carry on with the um, project. Um, next slide. If, we, if we've got time, I'll sh uh, um, show you one more thing. No? Not okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> if, if you feel like. No, no, it's fine. Yeah, maybe Sorry. we can go back to what you were talking about. It's going on. Our, it's our conversation. All right. Uh, Daniel, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, hello. Um, I'm Daniel. I was awarded the um, Hoya um, in 2022, in July 2022, which um, everybody's been to South Africa in July, it's very hot if you've been to Um And so I got into Ohio on the back of my MA project, which falls under everything, which was take it, my MA cost check paid during lockdown, so I really couldn't get into the university like I am now, or outside much, and so I had to develop practice very much in my own home. And so um, I Created a practice which was very much based on um, connecting with nearby like, creativity and nature um, and integrating text, poem, narrative into my own work. So when I went to Hoyer, I kind of wanted to develop on this, but in a space that's not one that I'm used to. And so if you go to the next slide. Um, so here's Hoyer's very beautiful um, space, lots of it in the generated pine forest, and as I said, it's very hot. And so you can only really go out and take photographs in the morning and in the evening. Um, and I'm not an early riser, and in the evening I like, like having dinner with everybody. So um, I really spent a lot of my time in this dark room <laughs> where they had a lot of old dark room equipment, um, which had been donated by other artists. And I just wanted to experiment and see what I could create and see what ideas I could come up with. And so if you go to the next slide, one of the first uh, little group of work I created was um, based on this, well I had an accident in the dark room where I like playing on some equipment, there's like one which has a light and a bunch of mirrors and basically shot a laser beam um, into my eye and it was fine uh, in the end after a few like scary minutes but um, it got me thinking about, so I like to read a lot as well to help me with coming up ideas and so I was reading the parable of the by David Butler which is a post-apocalyptic um, book so in America where there's lots of wildfires and terrible politics and at the same time in the UK there were wildfires and Liz Truss was just like winning the toy leadership race and um, and Elon Musk was sending rockets up into space and so I kind of created this work at the kind of intersection of all these ideas on kind of being burned by this accidental creation of technology like in which has led us to this point where we are today with climate change and how possibly the Earth might feel about being abandoned in the way that it is. I don't have time to read your poem, but you can use the next slide. Um, and so after that, I um, was looking for more inspiration. Another thing which I noticed in the landscape was that kind of when you're in this new landscape, I don't know if it's happened to anybody else, but you get this feeling of kind of being watched. Um, and there's all of these objects around which kind of look like faces and figures and you're like monkey brain activates and you just start seeing these things everywhere um, and so i started to document these and at the time i was also reading ursula k Le Guin, who i'm always reading um, she has a fantastic short story about um, a society of linguistics in the far future which can understand basically animal speech and they're discussing whether one day they'll be able to understand plant speech or the speech of the earth itself and so i kind of created these interactions with these animistic objects uh kind of creatures i thought of them as like trolls which have been like turned to stone in the light um and i have my own straight photograph and then i created a photogram on the same piece of photographic paper of objects which I collected from the scene or from the 
objects itself, which are photographic, and I like scattered those on particular photogram. Um, so it's different for each print that I created. And the idea is that maybe it's a conversation. I don't know if it's a conversation, but maybe one day in the far, far future, somebody will be able to tell me what they're trying to say. Okay, next slide. Um, at the time, I was also reading this book, uh, Web of Meaning by Jeremy Lent, which talks about art integration science, where you kind of learn like new science about neuroscience, plant science, all that kind of thing, how you can integrate this with, with, integrate this with indigenous wisdom. Um, and there's a really lovely ancient, the, a Taoist philosophy, part of Taoist philosophy called Li, which is the, um, um, the study of natural form, basically. So of things like the branches of of um, water, of uh, plants, um, things like that. And so it's very much looking into this idea of by understanding natural forms, we can come to understand the universe, maybe come to understand ourselves, and vice versa, by understanding ourselves and natural forms within ourselves, understanding the wider world. Um, yeah, and so I create these by like, putting leaves directly into the enlarger and kind of creating these double like, uh, photogram images. Okay. Um, I also created digital photography as well, which was very nice. Um, I was not much of a digital photographer at the time. I'm getting more into it now, so it's a practice and it's a nice way to like not be stuck in the dark room all the time. You can get to like edit in the living room with nobody else around. So um, it worked a bit better for me. Okay, next slide. Um, it's just some more digital photography. Next slide. And so after Fire, I was looking, continuing to look at natural forms and natural processes within nature, kind of way of collaborating with those to create um, very unique pieces which are like out of my own control. And so these ones are created using spore prints. If you want to go to the next slide, it's they're very simple to make. Put a mushroom, it makes a spore print. Um, it's directly on top of the negative. And I feel like the symbolism these kind of kind of speak for themselves. Like you have these halos, you have these eyes. Um, and if we go to the next slide, I continue to look at the sense of things like fungi, microbes, decomposition um, in these photos where I place film directly onto a petri dish, um, and the gelatin that is in the film, because um, the film is chemical suspended in gelatin. Um, becomes disintegrated by the um, bacteria that's in the atmosphere that's come into it, but also from within myself, like it was like carbon spit to be basically until it happens. Um, okay, next slide. And then these are some other examples of just experimenting with layering natural forms and things. Okay, next slide. Um, my current project is looking at uh, a way of integrating digital photography with my these current themes. So um, looking into concepts of like transhumanism and the idea of you know, one day if we're uploaded to the mainframe or in space or tra transhuman, um, what might happen to what we know about the natural world, our ancestral memories of the natural world. Um, and so using a lot of intentional camera movement and things and digital manipulation alongside this film manipulation. Okay, I'm gonna skip forwards. Let's skip forwards one more. So my current work is um, kind of going back to Hoya. I feel like when you do a lot of environmental art, you kind of feel like you're like slowly meandering along like a um, conveyor belt that's like going really fast backwards as the world's tumbled into destruction. And so one thing I really loved in Hoya was just this sense of being in a multidisciplinary group of people you all feel like you care about something or want to talk about it and I want to spend all my time around the dinner table just chatting with people and so I started creating this zine with my partner which is a collection of all sorts of things that can go in print, art, photography, short stories and so on but we're bringing it out into physical world events. We've recently been um, awarded an allotment in Bath and so we're very excited to look for ways that we can get communities involved in art and also physical natural world. Okay, thank you. Well, I am very conscious of time. So, all join the stage and um, 
question or any comment that you want to ask otherwise perhaps we can start with your conversation um what we did to question for the audience i know you had some questions there it, it was quite interesting I mean, you went to the same yeah. place so a similar journey uh, a quick with a kind of similar medium as well uh but but the experience of that land brought up very different investigations in a way or, or kind of it's not I don't know if you yeah. wanted to explore a little bit your Yeah, I thought it was interesting that because we did have a bit of crossover even though you um said that you want to do a bit more straight photography, but like something about that environment in the dark room which just makes you want to experiment. Um, yeah. So, can you tell us how you got like to the idea of creating photograms and things like that? Um, I think really up until um, Hoya, I, I, I'd really been uh, working digitally and I think I felt I, I was missing out in um, missing some materiality in my work basically and, and some hands-on experimentation so I, so I wanted and I thought I've got two weeks in this amazing interesting landscape um, and I've got a dark room <laughs> which is a rare thing yeah. for me because I, I don't have one and actually I do now post where I do have one um, but, but it was really the um, um, chance to experiment with film material yeah and also camera photography, which I've never done before. Um, that was, it was just like a chance to um, um, delve in try something new. Really. Um, so what I created in the end actually was, was really untypical of my work, <laughs> um, but it was, it, it was a really great opportunity. Yeah. Sorry, I've been told that we have one minute and a uh, half. Okay. Uh, just to see if there's any question from people here, people online. Um, it would be, I mean, this conversation could go on forever, as you were saying, Mike. Um, this was just um, a first encounter, a moment to get together um, and hopefully create new connections with your new project, for instance, maybe, you know, the art for the environment community is growing and expanding and interconnected um, as we um, also presented in the exhibition at Groundwork. So I'm afraid we need to um, conclude here. Conversations do want to continue. Dark and bar is open just now. We can move to the bar. Um, it might be a bit more intimate and nicer as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just I just wanted to remind about the next events. We have our next conversation uh, on Tuesday, the 23rd of April next week uh, at the Chelsea College of Arts. And the uh, following conversation on the 21st of May um, at uh, Central St. Martins, the food program and link to, um, to book is available on the you the postgraduate uh, Alpha Environment webpage and the event right. I don't know if there's yeah. a specific <laughs> link. But <laughs> just, just uh, to our social media postgrad community. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, uh, it is widely available. Um, and I wanted to thank you all for coming and joining and sharing wonderful presentations. Um, it's so interesting to see also the the evolution and how the certain concerns nonetheless remain um, because of the conditions we live in very much. And uh, thank you to the audience, thank you to the postgraduate, and I look forward to the next conversation. And please do join us and hopefully there will be more time for us. Thank <laughs> you.